All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Monique Van Hook, and I'm a professor here at George Mason, and I work, have my research lab at the Prince William campus, which is out in Manassas. It's separate from the main campus of the university. I'm very excited to tell you today about my topic, which is Healed by a Crocodile, or our search for new antibiotics. So in this current day and time, we are desperately in need of new antibiotics. Uh, there is a rampant uh, em emergence of antibiotic-resistant infections, and you can see on this graph the data for about the last 30 years. In the blue dots, we have methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus infections. This is the percent of incidence. And then we also see vancomycin-resistant enterococci and fluoroquinolone-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And what this data tells you is that what used to be very common infections are actually becoming untreatable. And this is very worrisome for medical practitioners and scientists alike. And so you would think that there would be a great emergence of new antibiotics coming on the market to address this impending crisis. But in fact, these data are the numbers of applications for new antibacterial agents at the FDA over the last 30 years. And you can see that this graph goes in exactly the opposite direction. And there are many, many fewer applications for new antibiotics now than there were 30 years ago. And today, currently, there are only one, there's only one or two applications for gram-negative bacterial antibiotics and only a small handful for gram-positives. And these are the two main types of bacteria. And this is very, very worrisome for scientists and for medical practitioners because we worry that we might be entering the dark ages of antibiotic resistance. And in addition, we have other crises impending upon us. So this is the global distribution of tuberculosis, which is sort of an old disease, but is actually re-emerging as a new threat uh, today. You can see that there are many countries that have a lot of tuberculosis. Of course, there's a convergence of tuberculosis and HIV. But in addition, there is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And this is the same uh, global view showing you the countries that have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. But the news is actually not even that bad. It's worse. We have extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. And these are the countries in the world that have at least one reported case of XDR, extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. And this is the form of tuberculosis that is almost untreatable. So in the face of these impending um, problems, we really need to consider antibiotics and what we're going to do about this problem. And let us not forget the days before there were antibiotics right, the pre-antibiotic era. So in the summer of 1924, a young man was playing tennis and developed a blister on his toe. And a week later, this young man was dead from an infection of this blister. This was Calvin Coolidge's son. And the president, when he heard this news, he wept. And he said, what is the use of the power and the glory of the presidency if I cannot save my son from a simple blister, right? This is what it was like before we had antibiotics. Here's another example. This young girl, she got a scratch on her chin. It became badly infected. She was, her face became so swollen. She was in a very high fever. She couldn't swallow. Her parents were so worried, and they rushed her to the hospital. And the doctors, they looked at this child, and upon examination, her records say that she was moribund. She was on the verge of death. Okay this little girl. But this little girl was very, very lucky because the year was 1942. And in this hospital, they had penicillin. And they gave this child penicillin. And after 14 days of penicillin, the girl was totally fine. So antibiotics are life-saving drugs. We cannot forget how many hundreds of millions of lives have been saved by antibiotics. And we should think of these antibiotics perhaps as a global resource that we really need to consider that we should protect this global resource. It's a treasure and a gift from prior generations of scientists and practitioners who have invented these drugs so that we can have these life-saving opportunities. And today, uh, there is now a big push to invent these new antibiotics in the face of the crisis, as I told you. And the Infectious Disease Society of America has this program called Bad Bugs Need Drugs and trying to promote the invention of 10 new antibiotics by the year 2020. So we like to be part of that process. And so in my research, we have tried to think, where can we find new antibiotics? 
So scientists like to look in the natural world for antibiotics. And so the first place that we wanted to look was in our immune system. And so we all have an immune system, and there's two main parts. There's a part called the specific immune system and the innate immune system. The specific immune system is the part where you get anti antibodies. If you get a vaccine or you get the flu and you recover, you make antibodies, and then you are protected against that particular strain of microbe. Um, now, the innate immune system is that part of your immunity that keeps you alive in the 14 to 21 days that it actually takes to make the antibodies. And this is a more generalized type of immunity. It's broader, uh, broader spectrum, okay? It's not quite so specific, but it's pretty good, and it's good enough to keep you alive for all of those days. So we wanted to look at that and see if there was something there that we could use to develop new, uh, new antibiotics. So the part of innate Part of the innate immune system is this thing called antimicrobial peptides. These are very, very small peptides, and I've drawn some cartoons of them up on, on this slide. So we like to draw cartoons of proteins, and these are very, very small. There's some complicated ones, there's some simpler ones that look like hairpins, and some that look like helices. And these very small peptides are made by your body in response to different kinds of infections. And they are able to kill bacteria. So here in the top, little box, you can see a little rod, that's my cartoon of an antimicrobial peptide, and they like to bind to the surface of bacteria. And when they bind to the surface of the bacteria, they sort of get together and they either sneak in and kill the bacteria, or they get together and make holes or pores in the bacterial membrane. That's the yellow thing that you can see. So they get together and they form pores in the bacteria, and when they do that, the bacteria blow up and they die. So <laughs> this is a very good way to kill bacteria with these peptides. So we have these in our bodies, and that's really a, a very useful thing. Now another tricky thing that bacteria can do is they make biofilm. Biofilm is a sticky uh, substance that the bacteria secrete kind of around themselves. You all know biofilm because it's on your teeth when you, in your plaque, that's a bacterial biofilm. And biofilms are thought to be involved in many, many uh, infections that we commonly know, sinus infections, ear infections, heart valves, uh, medical implants, osteomyelitis, these infections are actually all mediated by biofilm. So biofilm is this sticky substance that protects the bacteria from antibiotics and protects them from your immune system. So here I have a picture of a bacteria wearing kind of a raincoat, um, but in reality it looks more like this. These are two different bacteria. There's white rods and, and little white circles, and the blue stuff is the biofilm. And you can see that the bacteria are sort of encased in this biofilm. So no matter how good an antibiotic that you have, if you cannot get into this biofilm, if you cannot get to the bacteria, then you will not be able to kill them. So in our research, we're really thinking about this a lot and thinking, well, we also would like to have a drug or an approach that will eliminate biofilm or disrupt and break up this biofilm. So what we had done is we have um, uh, made antimicrobial peptides that are able to disrupt biofilm. So here you can see a picture of a biofilm that my student, my undergraduate student Scott Dean made on, in the yellow. And then when we treat it with one of these antimicrobial peptides, we're able to disrupt the biofilm very significantly, in this case almost seven times less material left after we treated it with these peptides. So we think this is a really important new approach to, an, to thinking about how to make new antibiotics. Not just to kill the bacteria, but to understand how they are um, sitting in context in their biofilms and to address that problem as well. So we feel that antimicrobial peptides are a very significant step forward for that. So where else can we find new antibiotics? Well, there are many other interesting things that we could look at. For example, alligators and crocodiles. These guys live in swamps, nasty, dirty water, horrible conditions, and they very rarely have infections on their bodies. They are very resistant. They have a very strong, innate <coughs> immune system. So we're very interested in those. This is a Komodo dragon. These guys have up to 50 pathogenic microbes in their mouths. But if they bite each other in fighting, they also don't get very infected. And they can have bleeding gums, and they don't get infected by these pathogenic microbes that are in their mouths. So these guys also have a strong, innate immune system. So maybe we could look there and find something interesting. 
This is a Chinese king cobra. I also brought my cobra. <laughs> and these cobras, it's very interesting, although they are venomous, they also, for reasons that we don't really understand, have antimicrobial peptides in their venom. And these peptides have very interesting properties that we have also studied. Okay, so for example, from the cobra, we uh, studied this antimicrobial peptide called the cathelicidin, and we found that it has a green bit, part of the sequence, is, we colored it green because it's really good as an antimicrobial peptide. It has a red bit that really wasn't very good, and we spent quite a bit of time understanding exactly why the red part wasn't very good. And after we did that for a while, we thought, huh, I wonder if we can take this antimicrobial peptide, which is pretty good, it kills bacteria in the lab, that's a good thing, but maybe we can make it actually a little bit better. So we engineered this peptide, and we took the red box and made it a better part of the peptide, and we were able to take a good antimicrobial peptide and make it at least two times better. So this is just an example of how we can take these naturally occurring peptides and they, we can change them, we can make synthetic versions, we can make mimetics to improve their performance as a maybe a more druggable compounds. So getting back to the crocodiles, because that's of course the most interesting part. So as I said, these guys live in swamps and they don't tend to have uh, very many infections on their bodies. They're also evolutionarily ancient. So they have had millennia of time to evolve the most effective ways to have strong innate immunity against bacteria. So people have also known that crocodile blood is quite antimicrobial, and people have tried to uh, sort of figure out why this is, but haven't necessarily been that successful till now. So how do you get antimicrobial peptides from a crocodile? Well, first you have to catch it, but I send somebody down to do that. And then they give us one precious vial of crocodile blood. And then we have to figure out how are we going to get these very, very small peptides out of this crocodile blood. So we have to use our advanced technologies of biochemistry and molecular biology in order to um, get the antimicrobial peptides out of the blood. So we like to do this thing called bioprospecting, and for the younger members of the audience, it made me think of Minecraft and bioprospecting in Minecraft. And uh, we really wanted to develop a method where we could uh, easily and rapidly survey many different kinds of samples, whether we have crocodile blood, maybe we have Komodo dragon saliva, maybe we take skin scrapings from a cobra or from a frog. We want to be able to use all these samples in our bioprospecting. So we need a technology that allows us to do that. We also want to use advanced biochemistry and nanomaterials and nanoparticles to help us accomplish these goals. So we developed this thing called bio, that we call bioprospector particles. Um, these are the particles right here, but really they're very, very small. They're nano-sized, nanometer-sized. They have a sieve on the outside and a core in the middle that binds to small, small proteins. So if we have a very complicated sample like crocodile blood, it has big proteins in red, it has little proteins in green and orange. And we use our particles, and we mix it in with the crocodile blood, and then the small peptides go inside the particle and get trapped in there. Then we can spin them away from all the big stuff. We concentrate our samples, and then we can, get a, then we can take the peptides off of our particles. Now we have a very concentrated, very small volume sample from that big amount of crocodile blood that we had. And then we can put this on a mass spectrometer, and we can identify what peptides that we have in that crocodile blood. So using this technique and some others, we're very excited that we identified our first crocodile antimicrobial peptide, and we just did this this year. So um, we, um, we call it CHOMP. It's a, it has a much more complicated scientific name, but we thought that was a really good name for it. And uh, it kills lots of different bad bacteria in the lab, and now we're testing it to see if we can change this peptide, make it more druggable, make it more useful for skin infections maybe. Um, that's kind of the way that we're thinking of developing this peptide. And this is a cartoon of our peptide. It's similar to a known class of antimicrobial peptides called hepcidins. So we're very excited about this research, and we're uh, very keen to know more about what's in that crocodile blood. So just as with the invention of penicillin, how it saved many, many lives and allowed many soldiers, for example, in the war to survive their war injuries, Looking forward to the crisis of antibiotic resistance, we really hope that maybe some of our crocodile-derived drugs or other kinds of drugs might allow us, that's our dream, <laughs> crocodilin, 
but might allow us to have a new class of antibiotics is really the point. We need new, new approaches and new ways of thinking about these problems to allow us to solve this problem. So I hope that I've been able to tell you that antibiotics are a critical and precious resource that we really have to consider uh, carefully going forward. And also to let you know that we urgently need to support research in developing new antibiotics. It's extremely important that we don't go back to the dark ages. We have to be creative in the way that we find new antibiotics. Maybe we need to be healed by crocodiles. Uh, maybe there's some other way. Uh, whatever that we need to do, it's very important that we do that. So I'd like to thank my uh, students that work with me in my research lab. So Scott Dean and Stephanie Barksdale did most of the work that you see here today. They're both my graduate students now. They were undergraduates at George Mason. And also my collaborator, Dr. Barney Bishop and Dr. Joel Schnur. And my work is supported by a grant from the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. So thank you very much. Thank you.